to get us going at 627 and not wait till 630? Are you all okay with that? Absolutely. All right. And um, Keith, you can mute everybody. That's not my dog. We've actually heard from all of the board members already, so we can skip you guys saying hello if you don't mind um, and just get going. So just wanna welcome everyone uh, and explain the purpose of tonight's meeting. Um, we have a monthly council meeting on a regular basis. Tonight's focus is gonna be on a topic that we probably don't hear and have not heard as much about in this crisis. And that is the highlighting of two essential social services being provided here in Fort Lauderdale and across Broward. We are honored to have the chief operating officers of 211 Broward, um, Frank, and the COO of Hands On Broward, Christina, respectively, presenting tonight. We're also, and I don't think we're joined yet, I don't see him, we're also privileged once again to have the Fort Lauderdale city manager, Chris Lagerbloom, and tonight he's gonna answer your COVID-19 questions. There are specific categories of questions that we've given to him that are related to our healthcare capacity, the continued protection of public health, financial assistance, and more. For some of the areas that are outside of the city's jurisdiction, Chris will share either anecdotal information that he is aware of or refer us to the right resource. Um, for the council and for our city staff and elected officials, our city's residents' health and safety are the top priority. Protection of our residents' financial well-being is also important as that, as well as that of our local businesses and employees. And certainly protection measures, especially for our first responders. Um, I just want to make this one point before I turn it over to you, Keith, to go over Zoom instructions, is um, what transpires for our community going forward, how bad this crisis gets and how long it will last is frankly, largely up to each of us. Yes, we need help from the state and the federal government, but our actions are being responsible and taking the recommended precautions for staying home and social distancing. Each of us individually will help drive successful transition through this crisis. We thank all of you for following the stay at home directive, for your patience and tolerance, and for doing everything you are doing to help others. These are trying times and I know we are all doing our best. Um, with that, what we're gonna do next is Keith is gonna go over a few Zoom instructions in terms of how to participate if you have a question. And then Mary is gonna conduct the roll call so we can make sure we have quorum for the one agenda item we have to vote on. Um, and then we'll turn it over to our two presenters, uh, Frank and Christina. With that, over to you, Keith. Okay, Colleen, can you see the slides okay? Just wanna double check that one more time. Uh, you muted yourself. I'm going to take that uh, as a yes. Thumbs up. Okay, good. Um, so uh, real briefly, just want to do some housekeeping on, on how to use Zoom because for many of you, this will be your first time. Uh, this will be very brief since for the most part, you just have to sort of sit back and listen throughout the presentation. Um, and apologies at the front end for anybody joining on the phone because most of this won't uh, relate to you specifically. Uh, first and foremost, before I forget, what I do want to say is if you get cut off, if your internet uh, goes down, um, or if my internet goes down, which would end the whole meeting, um, our instructions are to just go back to the email and join the link, and then we'll get the meeting started up again. I don't think that should be a problem, but just want to put that out there uh, in, case, um, in case something like that does happen. So just a few quick uh, expectations. Um, as you'll notice that your um, audio is cut at the moment. Um, so you don't have the ability to control your audio, which means that if you wanna participate in the conversation, there are sort of two things that you can do, um, which I'll show you in a second. You can either use the chat functionality that Zoom offers, or you can use the raise hand function. And if you raise your hand, I'm going to be keeping an eye on it throughout the meeting and we'll unmute you to allow you to raise your hand. Um, if you're sharing your video, which we encourage you to do, uh, please just be cognizant that you are doing that. Um, many of you probably seen the 
uh, viral video that's gone around since the coronavirus started of someone going to the bathroom and forgetting that they were on a Zoom meeting and everybody saw that they had done that. So we wanna to try to avoid stuff like that. Um, again, because we're virtual, if you have questions, please hold on to them until the appropriate time. We'll have breaks in the presentations for questions. And if, for those of you that are joining by phone, um, in order to participate, we ask that you email your, your questions to councilchorusspec at gmail.com. And that, was, that email is in the invite that you received. So you can look for it there um, and send some questions along. And we're going to have people monitoring that email throughout the call. Um, and last but not least, please just be flexible and understanding. This is the first time CFLCA is trying a virtual conference uh, meeting like this. Um, and so there may be some hiccups, um, but we'll get through them together. Um, so real quickly, just for those of you that are on Zoom, just so you can see some of the functionality, here's what the platform looks like. If you hover your mouse, um, you will see all the, the horizontal toolbar at the bottom. And that's what I'm going to go over really quickly. At the bottom left hand side, you'll see the mute and unmute functionality. Again, that you, you should get a pop up message if you try to use that. You don't have control over that at the moment, um, but if that's there. And if you want to turn your video on and off, that's there as well. Um, and they look, the icons look like this. In the middle section, you have an invite option, participants option, and share option. Um, since you're not the host, the share function is not going to do anything for you. Um, the invite option um, is going to allow you to send an email uh, with this link to join the Zoom meeting. If there's people that you think should be on the call that currently aren't, um, you can send the invitation their way. Um, but the most important one here is the participants. If you click on that, you'll see a whole list of everybody that's participating in this conversation. And you'll also see a raise hand um, option there. And that's if you have a question, that's where you'll find that button. So you can click that button. I will see your hand being raised uh, and I'll know to unmute your line. Um, and then lastly, uh, in the right hand side there, there's a chat and record functionality. The record functionality isn't gonna do anything for you. So um, that's not relevant, but the chat functionality again, we ask that you use that as well if you have questions or wanna ask to be unmuted and participate in the conversation. And if you click on the chat functionality, a pop-up will appear uh, and you'll see the whole chat conversation that's happening. You have the option to send the chat to everyone, which we encourage, or if you wanna send a question or comment to a particular participant, you can click the drop down and select somebody's name. Um, just best practice, if you do that, just be really careful. A number of times I've meant to send a message to an individual and it actually has gone to everyone, which is the default. Um, and that's it. Uh, Colleen, back over to you. Oh, yeah, hold on a sec. Yeah, I gotta meet you, sorry. Okay, so we're gonna conduct roll call now. Um, Michael Albetta, District 2 Rep and Board Member has also joined. Michael, just do you wanna say hello? Every other board member has said hello. Love to hear from you. I, I can unmute everybody for this if you'd like. No, that's, a, that's okay. Let, let's keep going. Um, Mary, I'm gonna have you conduct the roll call the way we talked about earlier and just to make sure we have quorum and Christina texted just to be safe um, so that we all know 12, 12 neighborhoods is required for quorum. So can you unmute Mary? Mary yeah, yeah. Thanks. She's still muted. Yeah. tell you, uh, my husband would like to have that power that Keith has right now. <laughs> okay, so for roll call, uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is go to the chat box. If you are actually on Zoom, in the chat box, will you type your name and association that you are representing? Or if you're not representing the, your neighborhood, I should say your HOA. Um, 
whatever neighborhood that you are from, or if you are from some other entity, if you would just type your name and um, what entity that might be. Or if you just don't really know how to identify yourself, just type your name so that I know who is here. Um, then for those that are calling in, if you would go to that email and do the same thing, type in your name and uh, what association you are representing. If you're not an alt or rep or president of association, just that you are from an association, whatever it is, or again, from whatever entity that you're representing, representing, or just your name if you're just um, on here for fun. Um, let's see, I think that's all for roll call. Does everybody understand how the chat box works? Everybody that's on Zoom? Okay. Also, um, as we have questions for the speakers, if you would also type them in the chat box and um, Keith and I will do the best we can to keep up with the questions both on, he's gonna help me with the uh, chat box and then um, I'll keep an eye on the uh, email. So Michael just texted me, he's here from Lake Ridge and says hello. So I'll just type that in as well. We have a quorum. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. All right. So. We're going to now start transitioning to our uh, two wonderful presenters. Um, we're going to start with Frank Izaza. Uh, Frank is the Chief Operating Officer from 211 Broward. He's going to speak to us about the call volumes that 211 has been experiencing and the kinds of calls that they are receiving. He's also going to explain an important program for local seniors called the Senior Touchline. Before he speaks, um, we have a piece that aired on CBS earlier today, or maybe it was last night, that is a wonderful, very brief overview of what 211 does. So Keith, if I could have you share that out. Yep. Can you see it now? Yep. Extend the pandemic and bring more <laughs> uncertainty, more apprehension, and yes, more fear. But we are lucky in South Florida to have agencies ready to help, and it starts with a simple phone call. CBS 4's Kerry Codd spoke with some who are on the front lines of this effort. Thank you for calling 211 Broward Hopeline. Juan Gonzalez is a helpline counselor with 211 Broward. You told me that you were a senior citizen and you won't have any transportation to get through. Since the COVID-19 crisis erupted in the U.S. and in South Florida, 211 Broward has been inundated with calls for help. In fact, they say their call volume is up 46% over February. How difficult is it for you as a helpline counselor to get these calls and hear the stress and the desperation in people's voices? Yeah, it can be overwhelming because we do know that the community is suffering a lot. Suffering, as Alan said, because with businesses shut down, people were out of work, struggling to pay rent or bills, and looking for any assistance they could get. There, there are a lot of families in the community that have children that don't know where, where their next meal is going to come from. 211's mission is to take the urgent calls from the unemployed or those who are hungry and refer them to agencies who can help. We've seen our program explode. Francisco Asaza is the Chief Operating Officer for 211 Broward. He said 211's 32 counselors in Broward also help dispel room for those surrounding the coronavirus stimulus package. We're definitely the front line. I mean, we're the front line for just rumor control. I mean, when they just first started out talking about the stimulus dollars, so on influx and calls about people asking, when am I going to get it? How much am I going to get it? For years, 211 Broward has provided an important community function. Even just listening to those who are scared and lonely or people with nowhere else to turn. It's not a worry about the impact on the community's mental health as the coronavirus crisis continues. What happens when you need to start paying those bills again? Where are you going to get the funds to do that? I think everybody's stressors is going to continue to intensify as this belongs. 211 Broward is open 24 7 for calls. The calls can be confidential, and there's a trained counselor prepared to answer each call. 211 Broward is a nonprofit. They're always looking for donations. If you want to help them, go to our website, cbsmiami.com. We will link you to their website. In Fort Lauderdale, Kerry Cobb, CBS 4 News tonight. Carrie, thank you. A reminder, the state is also manning a hotline that's open 24-7 to answer your questions about the coronavirus. That phone number is on your screen, and there's also an email address you can send questions to. That is COVID-19 at flhealth.gov. Wonderful. All right, so uh, I, can we transition to Frank now? And Frank, it, the floor is yours to tell us more. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of you giving me time to talk to you tonight. Um, 
I was really interested when I was hearing everybody talk, um, just appreciative that you're here to help our community and here to help for Lario to be safe during this really difficult time. And the fact you're sharing this time with me now when you're experiencing this at the same time, it's really hopeful to me because I know I heard some people are stressed and some people are anxious and some people weren't feeling well. That you're still here trying to learn how you could help your community. So that's really inspiring to me. So I was asked to talk to you about um, 211. And I'm going to talk to you about the three digit number and then I'll tell you about our services. And after I tell you about our services, I'll talk to you about some of our special programs that we offer to our community that you might not know about. And then I'll focus what we're doing right now to help our community experiencing COVID. So many of you might know about the three digit number 211 and some of you might not. So I thought I would just talk to you about the three digit number 211 so you know what it is. Um, it's a three digit number that anyone could dial nationally 24 hours a day to access services within their community. It's a three digit number like 911, 411, 611. So when you dial 211, you get connected to your local 211 center. So if you lived in New York, you could dial 211. If you lived in Miami, you could dial 211 and you would get connected to your local center to find out what resources are available to you right now. And that might be really helpful for you to know because you might have friends and family across the nation that could benefit from calling 211 because we all offer this one core service, which is how can we connect you to all the services that are available to your community? So if you wanted to know today, where do I get tested if I have COVID or where do I get information about how to get food in your local communities, people could dial 211 24 hours a day, seven days a week across the nation. In Florida, we're 100% covered. So what happens when you dial 211 within Broward County, you get connected to our call center. We're independent of each other. So we serve Broward County. So anyone that dials 211 in Broward County will reach 211 Broward. Now we are, are a comprehensive helpline, which means besides offering information referral, that core 211 service, we're also a crisis helpline. So anyone experiencing a life-threatening situation could call us 24 hours a day to talk to us, such as suicide, child abuse, elderly neglect or exploitation, um, domestic violence. We're here to provide anyone support during those crises where we could talk to them over the phone and give them some hope. So we have programs that help special target populations. We have a program that services our veterans and any veteran families. We have programs that help families that have children with special needs and behavioral health issues. So if you um, have households that um, have those target populations, we have what we call care coordinators that work with them on an ongoing basis to help them navigate the different systems that are available to them in our community. So for example, if a veteran needed case management services, we're able to provide that and connect them to that specific targeted service. Or if a family had a child with autism and wanted to find a dentist that would help the child, we would be able to help them connect with those type of services. Now the program that I was specifically asked to talk about today is Touchline. Now that's a daily reassurance call for seniors who are 60 years of age and that live alone in Broward County. And we call them on a daily basis and it's a free um, telephone reassurance call. Um, if you're familiar with what uh, some seniors experience when you're over the age of 60, you often outlive your friends and your family. Sometimes you have no one calling you. So what we do is every day we call you and say, hey, John, how are you doing today? You didn't tell me you weren't feeling well yesterday. How are you feeling today? And I know you had a doctor's appointment. Are you gonna go to your doctor's appointment today? Um, we've seen an influx of seniors actually apply for the program during this COVID as they feel that they're more socially isolated and they feel more vulnerable um, because of COVID. So it's a free program. We are still accepting applications. Um, any senior could apply to um, join our Touchland program. And it's a really easy application to fill out. Now, what are we 
how are we helping during this time of COVID so you understand how we could support our community right now? We are a 24 hour center, seven days a week. Anybody could call us to get any information about available resources that are in our community. So right now we have a lot of people calling us really anxious and scared about how are they gonna pay their rent because they lost their jobs. Um, recently in the last couple of days, we had increased number of people asking us, you know, how do I get a mask? Because I really am scared that I'm gonna um, get, get this virus. Um, where do I get food? And I'm a senior and I'm at home and I need someone to deliver that food to me. Um, what we do is provide information about those community resources. And that's a very dynamic process. It's more than just a 411. So when you call 411, they just give you the phone number. But when you're trying to find help, you don't want to be referred to nine or 10 different places and say, here, like we don't offer that anymore. I'm not eligible. So when we give people information, we're trying to make sure that information is connected them to the right resource. Um, when you don't know where to get help, on average, you're making about eight different calls. You might have experienced this when you're trying to find help for somebody and they say, well, we're no longer do that. That's the wrong number. They're not eligible and it becomes really, really frustrating. So what we do is make sure that we give you the information to make sure that the referrals we're giving you are able to, able to connect you to resources. Um, and when I talk about crisis services, I just wanted to touch on that because this is a really challenging time for everybody. If you think about what COVID has caused for our nation, we are, people are experiencing losing their jobs. People are experiencing losing friends and family unexpectedly to death. We have people losing their income. We have people losing their friends, just not even being able to talk to them. And when you talk about this type of loss, that puts people at higher risk of suicide. And when people are thinking about suicide, I, I want them to have a place to call 24 hours a day or they could just talk to someone to get some hope and that's what 211 Broward's here for. So anyone experiencing a crisis could call 211. What I want you to also think about, because I've been talking about this a lot, is right now, a lot of people are safer than what's gonna happen in a couple months once we go through recovery. Because if you think about it, right now, a lot of mortgage companies, a lot of credit card companies, a lot of landlords, even FP&L, the electric companies, they're being more lenient right now and they're allowing people not to pay. And what's gonna happen though in two or three months when people had lost their jobs and there's no place for them to find work yet. So I think we're gonna be in a very challenging time as we actually go through the recovery process. It's just not gonna be right now that's gonna be tough, but the recovery process is gonna be tough. And I wanna make sure everybody knows that people could call us even during the recovery process because we wanna make sure when people are trying to recover that we could find them places for help. And just another food for thought for you. Um, during this time, um, you probably have been experiencing stress and maybe working from home and you've never worked from home before and that's challenging. I just hope everybody considers self-care and make sure they do something fun after this call, I hope you do a dance or do something that makes you energetic again and just take some time to take care of yourself. Drink that glass of wine <laughs> and if you need to drink too, but do something just to take care of yourselves because you are helpers, but helpers need um, to take care of themselves as well. So thank you for your time. And I don't know if you had questions from the chat, but uh, I'm open to questions or afterwards after the next presentation too. Just thank you. Keith, do you want to ask the questions? Um, I've got two. I don't know if anyone else has any. Yeah, Colleen, do you want to start? Because you have you have the first question here. Um, yeah. So, Frank, thank you so much. Very, very valuable service. And uh, I don't think enough people know about the good work that 211 does. So thank you very much. Um, the senior touchline application, it says very clearly it has to be mailed in. Mm -hmm. Is there an option to email it? Does it have to be mailed in? And question number two, last question is, what are your current daily call volumes? What, you know, what are you, how many calls are you handling on a daily basis? Um, for the month of February, we handled almost 9,000 calls. So that was pretty tough. Um, we just experienced over 40, 46% increase in call volume. So we, in late March, we were almost hovering around 2,000 calls um, a week. 
So it's been a really challenging time for us to make sure that we're here for our, our community. Um, the Touchline application, um, Keith, if you could email everybody or Colleen, the, this email address, it's touchline at 211-broward.org. You know, if somebody scans it or takes a picture of it, it could be sent to that email. Because um, we, if they call that number two, um, the number that was on the application, we'll help them with the application as well. So if anybody has any questions about the application, we'll help walk the person through it and help them in any way possible to get that application back to us. That, that's a wonderful service. And I see a question from John Burns. Um, can you submit an application for an elderly resident without their permission? Can no. you do an anonymous referral? Unfortunately, we can't. We, we have to have seniors be able to um, provide permission for the call. Okay, great. How long has this service been around? Um, 211 Broward's actually been around for 25 years. Um, 211 across the nation them. since 2011. Wonderful. Um, the touchline for seniors, this is a great question from Melinda. Um, is it possible that the, el the senior that receives the call receive it from the same person every day? It's mostly done by the same person every day, but not always the same person. Um, we have paid staff and volunteers that help us with the program. So it's, it's often consistently the same person, but not always the same. Good question. And how is the service funded? 211 is a nonprofit, so the state federal grants other I wish there were state and federal grants. No, we, you know, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, most of our funding comes from four main funders in our community, the United Way of Broward County, Children's Services Council of Broward County, Broward County Board of Commissioners, and Broward Health Coalition, Broward Behavioral Health Coalition. Those are our four largest funders. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so we've got two more questions coming in. One from Abby. Is there any way we can help with calls remotely? For instance, I've been trained by the Samaritans on suicide prevention. Can calls be routed to volunteers? Abby, right now, no, but we're trying to work on that capacity because we feel like our call volume is going to continue to increase. Um, feel free. You could call that um, touchline number and ask for a volunteer application so we could get it out. That'd be an easy way for anybody that's interested in volunteering to get connected with us. But we are trying to find ways to continue remote working once this, uh, once we're in the recovery phase. So a request for the volunteer application can go to the same email address you gave us, right? Yes, we'll make sure it gets to the right person. Okay, fantastic, Abby, thank you. I didn't know you were trained in that, awesome. Um, Tara, what if someone has an out-of-state cell phone, would that still connect to the local 211 or does it connect to the state of origin? Um, Typically, cell phone towers will connect you to the right 211. Um, if for any reason they don't, that local 211, we, we really work well together. We usually make sure that we connect you to the right 211. Wonderful. Um, does 211 coordinate food distribution? I mean, I know we've seen a lot from Feeding South Florida and United Way's efforts, um, mm -hmm. but for 211, I don't, anyway, it, it, do you do that? If so, what is the process? What we do with that process is educate people about those locations that are offering the food. So when people call 211, what we do is make sure we could tell you where you could get food. So for example, right now, even though that the schools are closed, the schools are offering food for families with children and we make sure to tell the parents which locations they could go to to get um, their children fed. Fantastic. Um, and the same person that asked you about anonymous referrals, would you be willing to speak to caregivers or family to try and convince seniors to use the service? When, so if you are concerned about anyone, any senior, and you call that 640 number that's on the application, you say, hey, can you reach out to this person for me? We will reach out to the person as long as we, you give us permission to share your name with them. So for example, Marilyn, you had the wine glass, so I saw you quickly. So if Marilyn called me, called us and said, hey, I really want Mary to be part of this program, can you call her? 
Uh, we'll call Mary as long as Marilyn says, hey, hey, Mary, Marilyn said we could call you. She was wanting us to tell you about our program. Can we talk to you about the program? And if she says, no, Marilyn shouldn't have bothered you, then we'll say, we're so sorry. Talk to Marilyn. Okay, wonderful. Um, any other questions from anyone? I think we're, we're good with questions. Uh, very appreciative audience here, Frank. So uh, very grateful that you came tonight and shared with us. And uh, I, I don't know, will we have an email address to follow up if there are any follow-up questions. Perfect. Uh, I like I said, everybody, please do some self-care. Have a good night. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Bravo. Um, okay. Our next illustrious presenter is Christina, Christina De Silva. She is the COO of Hands On Broward. Um, I have personally worked with Hands On Broward on a number of occasions for a number of different projects. Um, and everyone knows George Hruska. I don't know, I don't know if I see George anymore, but our, our illustrious right here he is our George from the city of Fort Lauderdale. Hands On Broward is, is similar in the sense that they do a lot of um, uh, volunteerism efforts, um, but they don't only mobilize volunteers for the city of Fort Lauderdale to cross Broward, but it's also, I believe, a national organization. They're very, very large, and they have curated, I think, a, a wonderful set of virtual toolbox um, items um, for us to consider during the COVID crisis. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Christina, and thank you very much for being here, Christina. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I just, I want to say, you know, I have not ever met Frank in the 12 and a half years that I have been at Hands on Broward, but I have a very high opinion of 2 on one Broward and what they do in the community. So it's pretty cool to be here speaking alongside you, Frank. Um, not only do I admire the work you do and your team, but the way in which you celebrate um, our community and bring all our nonprofits together. So it's really cool to be here. Um, a little bit about Hands On Broward for those who don't know. Um, our mission really is to empower people to make a difference for causes that they care about. Um, simply put, we put people to work. It's all about people power and through a volunteer capacity, um, connecting volunteers to opportunities to make a difference. Um, we are a 70, well, I'm sorry, 46 year old organization. We were, we were a, we're a legacy project of the Junior League of Greater Fort Lauderdale. So we were established in 1974, um, back in the day when volunteerism looked much different. Um, I think like the number, we started with two volunteers and the number one opportunity was, you know, filing and clerical work. So we have come a long way with what our volunteers and our communities um, are doing now. But we are, as you said, also a part of a much larger organization. Um, the Points of Light Institute is a network of over 250 volunteer mobilization organizations working to put people uh, as the center of change throughout the world. Um, locally, we are funded by the Children's Services Council of Broward County, uh, the Community Foundation of Broward County, and then we get a lot um, of our additional funding from private and corporate uh, foundations. Um, and so how do we do that? And I have a slide, uh, Keith, that has the four pillars, um, what we call our four pillars of engagement. Um, and I, I'm not gonna read all the way through all of these, but kind of in a nutshell, we have really what we would consider four different customers, if you will. Um, our hands-on direct pillar, you know, we're really focused on mobilizing volunteers um, in a direct capacity to serve the community with Hands on Broward. And we have several initiatives through which we do that, including our DIY volunteering, um, National Days of Service, on MLK Day of Service, we can mobilize anywhere between 250 volunteers on a single day of service. A lot of that work is done hands-on, shoulder to shoulder. And so we are experiencing quite a change in the way that we are trying to mobilize now um, because we are an organization that really serves to unite people um, in a physical capacity. Um, and, and we do that through a lot of great collaborations and a lot of great partnerships. Um, our second pillar is Hands-On Connect. And through Hands on Connect, which is primarily funded by the Children's Services Council of Broward County, we support local nonprofits 
Uh, many of them are smaller nonprofits that typically don't have the capacity to um, have a volunteer program. And so we become kind of their volunteer manager. Um, and so we have a technology that's called Hands on Connect that enables nonprofits to post their opportunities, to manage their volunteer data, to communicate with their volunteers. Um, and we try to put everything in a place that's easy for them to manage. In addition to that, we help um, by seeking out project leaders that support their work in a volunteer management capacity. And so we have on any given week, several um, dozen projects. We can have between 100 and 150 in a month that are strictly nonprofit partner referral projects where we're, we're pushing volunteers out into the community to support those that need it the most. Uh, hands on at work is our business activation pillar. And we get a lot of incredible community work done through that pillar uh, in partnership with local business, with local and national businesses, because um, a lot of that comes through our global affiliation. And so the hands-on network, which is also a point, uh, part of the Points of Light Institute, has national partnerships. And so those projects flow down into local markets and we're able to have several hundred corporate volunteers come out on a day into our communities uh, and help us to do community re uh, revitalizations. We do makeover projects. Uh, we build gardens and schools. Uh, whatever the impact priority is of that company, we work to engage them in our community to make a positive and meaningful difference. Um, and then finally, hands-on learning. And hands-on learning is the pillar through which we engage young people. And so our, our commitment to young people through hands-on learning is to teach them that you're never too young to make a difference. And so we have a few different ways and we're, we're really proud of it because I'm, I'm always so inspired by the impact that kids can make and how once that seed is planted, the things that they can end up doing. And we've had kids that have come to us from very, very small and grown with us all the way up to high school. And they've moved from our kids care club, which engages, you know, five and up in monthly activities. And a lot of those are kind of do it yourself stuff. They can do it with their parents. They drop them off on a monthly basis and they're learning about community issues while they're creating these kits or putting together I think we're, you know, we're going to be doing masks next month and we have different flashcard activities, but each one of the activities that they participate in is tied to a community issue. And so there is, a, there's a learning component to all of it. And then through that project where they are learning, they are able to donate something that will make a difference for one of our nonprofit partners. Um, and then as we get the older kids into their teens, uh, we have a teen service squad and that's really more of a service learning program so the kids can kind of be the creators of change choose their own social causes and develop solutions to those community issues and implement them themselves and then in addition to that we do some really cool summer camp activities where we'll take the kids to a week we'll we'll have field trips to several different nonprofits. each day we'll have a different uh, issue that we'll talk about We'll do issue education. We'll put them on a bus, take them to a nonprofit. They will serve to make an impact for that nonprofit. Um, and at the end of the week, we find that there are a lot of really great connections made and that we've learned a lot about what's important um, in our neighborhoods. And so that's kind of the overview of our basic structure and the programs that we have. And now we are trying to figure out how to take all of that shoulder to shoulder work um, and create new ways of engagement because what we are seeing um, in terms of volunteer mobilization is that everybody's just scared and rightly so. So, you know, we are, we are used to last year, 12,200 volunteers, we mobilized out into the community to make a difference uh, for local nonprofits. And so now what is that going to look like for us moving forward? It's just natural. I know we had after the, after the Parkland tragedy, the MSD tragedy, we found that just finding simple ways to give people an outlet to make a difference. And by it's, it's, it really has become so simple and you're seeing it all over the news. You're seeing everybody parking their cars and honking and clapping for first responders and for 
and for care workers. You're seeing neighbors stopping to, to find what they can do to help um, a, a senior living next door. And so it's these simple acts of service that we're really trying to focus on to give people an outlet for their empathy. And so we have, we also though want to continue to support our nonprofit partners. So thank you, Keith. This is our, you know, this is a website where we've kind of collecting all of the information and we want to figure out how to keep that hands-on connect pillar working so that we're supporting those nonprofits that need it the most. And we've had to, you know, kind of back off of a lot of the projects that we've got on there, but there are those essential services where volunteers are still greatly needed. And so we want to, through Hands on Connect, still continue to be a resource for our food pantries. You know, we've been out helping our partners at Feeding South Florida at Meals on Wheels Broward. We were at the Las Olas Chabad with United Way and the Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce, and they put meals into hundreds of people's trunks. And it was, it was a very powerful and much needed thing. And so it's very important to us that we still provide a resource uh, um, through our volunteer network to those nonprofit partners. And this is where, when I would say, you know, to all of you, when you see a need, um, you know, I will have my contact information. Um, let us see if we can be a, of service to help. If we cannot provide volunteer support for that particular opportunity, we would like to connect you to the, to the organization that can. And so, this is an ever evolving kind of list of opportunities uh, as they are needed. We place them up on the website and we're also trying to do a lot on social media uh, to kind of promote uh, what our partners are doing and so that we can get folks who wanna help into the places that need it the most. Um, and then if we wanna click on the hands-on connect link at the bottom of the page there, or I'm sorry, not hands-on connect, hands-on at home, yeah, right there that will take us to a bank of opportunities that we have created for individuals, families, and kids to make a difference from the comfort of their own home. Nope, that's the donation link. Nope. <laughs> um, down under current, yep, there you are, okay. So we've got um, a few things listed under the projects. The first is the pen pal. We kind of kicked everything off with that and it's been um, a process in learning. You know, the, the original idea was that we were gonna go old school and we were gonna have people writing letters to, you know, seniors or people who are shut in. Um, and then there were, there were a lot of uh, concerns even about that. And so this project itself is, is ever changing. We've actually kind of gotten a lot more emails uh, and letters um, I mean, because there's not a lot getting into the senior living facilities at this point, not even mail. And so we have a form on the website where you can, you know, sign somebody up to receive a letter. There's a form that you can fill out if you want to write a letter and then we're matching folks up um, to communicate. So if you're not able to participate in the senior touch line, this is an, a secondary opp opportunity for you. Um, we're also collecting videos from people that want to send messages. We've got so many folks out in the community. We have pharmacy workers, first responders, care workers, delivery workers, all those essential workers that are out there putting their, their lives on the line for us. Um, we want to kind of get messages of support out to them. And so we have, you know, 15 to 90 second videos that we're going to create and we're just going to keep pushing them out into the community through social media. This is an opportunity for people to say what's on their mind. Um, and, and, you know, we've also created, uh, I know that Broward County Public Schools is, is not requiring the 40 hours for graduation since we've moved into this, but these, if anybody does need hours for any form of volunteering program, all they have to do is submit their, their good deed to us and they can get hours for that, that as well. We've also got a DIY volunteering kit. so. That's gonna take you to an opportunity that we've just listed where you can create masks because we've got a lot of information now that's coming out with regard to um, masks and how maybe it's not such a bad thing um, for everyone to wear them. So we have, if you have a sewing machine, there's a, there's a kit up there that will help you to learn how to create masks and then we'll, we'll match them up with the need. Um, a couple others that we are doing, we have a, a literacy program and we have, 
guest readers. We're calling them Storytime Heroes. And so it really is about taking a, your favorite children's book, setting up your cell phone and videotaping yourself reading it and send it to us. And once we screen all those videos, we're gonna make them available for parents to use at home during story time with the kids. Um, and then our acts of service challenge really does leave it up to the volunteer um, to kind of make a difference following social distancing guidelines um, to make a difference in any way that you would see fit. And so we had, you know, one of our team members as a mother who is 93 years old and she's kind of going through a hard time right now because she's obviously stuck in and she's scared. And a couple of nights ago, a new neighbor had moved into town and it was a mother and her four-year-old daughter, Zoe. And they stopped far enough away just to kind of have a conversation with her and to talk to her. Do you need anything? Can we go to the grocery store for you? Can we pick up any medicine for you? Um, and she was having things delivered, so she didn't need it at the time. But she woke up the next morning and she sent us a picture of it. But there, uh, there, was, a, there was a drawing stuck under her door of rainbows. And that simple act of kindness made Louise's day. And so those are the things that we're starting to see people share. And we want to make sure that we're a conduit for that kindness and that we're keeping people thinking about one another. It's, I, you know, it's, it's like Frank said, this is a really difficult and really challenging time for all of us. But if we look around, we can see the power of compassion and the power of empathy in everything and in the way that we respond to one another during these times. And so we just wanna provide a, a forum for that to happen um, and for people to share, um, but also to support our, our partners in the process. And so, you know, that's kind of the, the 411 on what we're doing there. Um, I would say as a call to action for all, uh, all who are listening to stay connected um, support your local nonprofits like 211, like your local food pantry. Call upon your resources that are offered to you um, and, and volunteer. You know, if not now, then, you know, when you can. Because I think when we all come back to this or we all come back to where we can come together, the needs are going to be great. And so um, please consider us a, a resource for you throughout the entire process. Thank you, Christina. That's wonderful. I think you said it just so aptly, conduit to kindness. That's kind of what it's all about right now. So um, Christina has a question. The flyer lists Danny as the contact for youth engagement. Is that still accurate? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions from anybody? If you want to chat the question. Otherwise, we just want to give you a big thank you. Um, awesome. The work you're doing and you know your staff and your team, they're amazing. Could not be thank more you. grateful. Yeah, so. I couldn't be more grateful for them too. You know, we, we feel always feel so very fortunate to have each other. And you know, we when all of the craziness is going on, it doesn't seem, you know, no matter what it is, all of the calls that we get when our for, our phones ring is how can I help? How can I help? How can I help? So you know, it's, it's, our task is always to find, to find that, that way for them to help. And so any, any ideas, that's why I also love anybody who ever has any ideas or something new that sparks inside you that think, oh, how could I make this happen? That's a good opportunity to send me over an email because that's civic leadership. And that is really, a, you know, about how can I find a way to empower you to make a difference in the way that you want to. Would you be okay if we shared your email or is there an info at hands on Broward that we oh, should share? share mine? Yeah, okay. for sure. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Christina. Very comprehensive, really wonderful. We look thank forward you. to staying connected with you and thank you for the productive opportunity uh, <laughs> to be kind and in a remote way. Yes. Awesome. All right. So thank you and good luck with the rest of your assignments tonight, Christina. I know you thank you. got to go. <laughs> Um, and Christina, what's your, I, I'll, uh, Christina Curry, I'll give you Christina's email separately. She's texted me that. So thank you. 
Um, all right, so we, our next presenter is obviously the wonderful city manager, Chris Lagerbloom. Um, before we turn it over to him, I just also want to announce that we have uh, District 2 Commissioner Stephen Glassman on the call. And I don't know, Stephen, if you just want to say hello. I know we got the announcement about the federal courthouse locations um, earlier today. I don't know if uh, that's something you or Chris want to speak to, but Steve, if, can you unmute Steve Glassman's phone and allow him to say hello? Is he, is he joining by phone, uh, Colleen? No, he's on the Zoom. The Zoom? Then I, yeah, I believe I've unmuted him. Commissioner Glassman? Bated breath, Commissioner Glassman, no. Hello? Okay, how about we come back to Steve if we have time uh, and circle at the end. But thank you, Steve, for joining us tonight. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. And Keith, you can unmute Chris. And oh, wow, you're in a cool place, Chris. Where are you? You like that? Yeah, we wanna be with you. No, we We've can't. We've had to have right. so many of these uh, meetings. We've all gotten creative with uh, what we put behind ourselves. So that is my picture today of the uh, Zondam entering Port Everglades. So. Oh, don't even, I don't even know if we want to go there. But. We're going to talk on that topic. Yes. Okay. So you've got the categories, you've got the questions. I do. Let's just watch Chris in his background for now. So we'll, uh, we'll start out with a little bit of levity because this is one of the better ones that we have had somebody show up to a meeting um, with. That's <laughs> uh, <coughs> in their garage. So, uh, we have a little bit of humor in the, the stacks of toilet paper and, and every other video that uh, every other picture that comes up. So um, let's uh, <clears throat> let's start with uh, the cruise ships because it's the it's what happened today and it's probably what people are wondering about and, and how it happened. Um, I'll start by saying though that uh, you know, the city of Fort Lauderdale is not part of that decision making tree. It was part of a unified command. Um, that unified command consisted of the CDC, the county, the Coast Guard, and a, a handful of other people. Um, and so we, uh, you know, we obviously watched it very closely because as the world was watching it, the, the ships weren't coming back to Broward County, they were coming back to Fort Lauderdale. And so, you know, whether you, we had any decision-making authority in it or not, we, uh, we stayed pretty up to speed as to what was going on. Uh, we did have the opportunity to talk to the CEO of Holland America um, two days ago now, the day before that the, they entered the port, um, they very clearly described what their plan was. Um, they had a three-part a three part plan uh, to keep people separate and to get people on charter airplanes to get them out of Broward County, um, and then to keep others on the ship that were exhibiting any type of symptoms and medevacing those to uh, Broward Health that needed immediate treatment. So um, they had been denied every port coming north from Argentina. Um, Chile did not let them in. Cuba did not let them in. Um, they tried to get in in all those different places and uh, they just didn't have any luck. So um, the county came to the decision that it was the right thing for them to uh, enter at Port Everglades and uh, allow these people to disembark and many of them get home uh, and the others get the treatment that hopefully that they uh, needed. So they're there now. Uh, they will likely go back out to sea and still have people on them. Those are the people that don't need immediate hospital treatment, but also can't be uh, released or discharged back into uh, the, the main population. So uh, there were planes waiting for them at FLL, and there's a plane going to Canada and a plane going to uh, uh, England, and they basically uh, got a bunch of planes to just uh, transfer folks from, from bus to, to plane to uh, out of town. So I, I wish them all the all the best, but I, I know it was a very reasoned and, and hard decision to make, um, but that uh, they, they considered a lot of factors in, in coming to that uh, conclusion. Let me look over here at my list that I have printed out next to me and talk a little bit about these topics and then also refer you to some great places and maybe even send some stuff by email because anytime you have a disaster like this or yeah, I guess pandemic week, we could, it's called, um, a lot of a lot of helping hands uh, jump in and jump in quickly, and I can tell you, just like the other two presenters that uh, commented about how everybody's compassionate and jumping in and wanting to help, I have found that to be uh, um, the same. My screen just changed. Oh, you put the agenda up there. Okay. So healthcare, um, we are in touch with the the hospitals that are in Fort Lauderdale. They are not at capacity today. Um, they're still accepting additional new patients. 
Um, they likely will be to capacity at some point. Um, Broward County and City of Fort Lauderdale was the first to receive a field hospital uh, from the state. So when we had our first case identified, uh, we reached out to the Director of Emergency Management in Tallahassee um, and said, you know, we now have a confirmed case in Broward County. It is an a, assisted living facility and those typically spread quickly. Um, and Director Moskowitz was very quick to uh, say, I'm sending you a hospital. And so it's been set up, it's mobilized, it's on Commercial Boulevard, 1515 West Commercial, up by the Executive Airport. Um, it's been mobilized and is standing down at this point. So uh, it's not operating, uh, although there are two big truckloads of medical equipment that left the state this morning, um, destined for that field hospital at some point uh, overnight tonight. Um, so they're starting to uh, ship in materials. I don't know if that's a sign of the, the fact that they think that it needs to open or if it's just a sign of the fact that it's better to have that stuff here and be ready to go at a moment's notice than to have to try to get it here when you decide that you want to open it up. Um, what, what are we planning for? And that's the best question in, in the world. And we look at all these bell models and, you know, we, we have this now new uh, phrase of flattening the curve and, and all this other stuff that we're doing. And, and we, the, the numbers are still going up uh, on a daily basis. We haven't hit a peak. Um, I love the uh, Florida Department of Health dashboard, and I'm happy to send that link out to the group. <clears throat> you can check in, in very real time, twice a day, they update the numbers. And you can go county by county, test by test, uh, how many people have been tested, how many are positive, how many are hospitalized. It, it really is a great dashboard and a screenshot um, of, of COVID-19 in Florida. Uh, we're still behind Broward County, thank goodness. Uh, they're outpacing us in, uh, in uh, COVID-19 confirmed cases, uh, but uh, Broward County is the, the second most active county in the state of Florida now with with confirmed cases. I think those numbers will go up once we start to do more testing. We've all heard that too, that uh, we have some of the test sites that were opened up have been closed down because they couldn't go a whole nother day. Uh, Broward Health, for example, uh, had a, a tent set up and they were doing testing and they just ran out of test material. And so um, they kept a couple, uh, but they, they couldn't do a whole day. And if they couldn't do a whole day, they, uh, they decided they were gonna just hold the supply that they had until they could. Um, do a whole day. So um, one of the things I heard earlier tonight as I was uh, listening to some of the other presenters, Matt Caldwell called me. Many of you might know Matt. He's the president of Flor uh, the Florida Panthers. Um, they've offered up their, uh, their lease location there at the War Memorial at Holiday Park for um, a testing site location. They're trying to partner with a, uh, um, with a medical provider and, and everybody's just giving right now. And it's, it's great that every phone call I get is somebody who wants to offer something else. And so on the screen, that's the dashboard that uh, I like to look at. You can see in the bottom uh, left-hand corner is the new cases by day. Um, that's still you know, going up day, day to day. So we haven't uh, hit the top yet where we're, we're seeing even a slight decrease or, uh, or um, it to come back down the other direction. We wouldn't expect it this soon, um, but that's a great place to uh, uh, continue and look and see how the cases are being uh, identified in the, in the county. It's interesting to see the map in the middle. Um, the dark blue is the color that we were this morning when I uh, checked this for the first time. That must mean that Miami's really, or Dade County's really outpacing us. What are, what are we at? 1481. So that's up a couple hundred from yesterday. Um, so it's, uh, you know, this is just a good, good dashboard to watch. If you go down to the bottom, I think Keith, you're driving, go down to the bottom and, and say Florida testing. And then you can click on Broward County and get some sense as to how many tests have been done in Broward County. Um, and uh, yeah, that, uh, the box over there on the side has got great helpful um, information. And then if you go down to cases by county, um, it, uh, you have to go over all the way to the right and click Broward. And it'll right size then for Broward. You can see there's more Broward middle age than maybe statewide. It, it pushes over a little bit to the right, but uh, this is worth checking once a day, uh, twice a day, more often if you're interested, just so you can kind of keep some sense as to where this is going um, in, in Florida. Um, healthcare support for residents. So 
I think the 211 discussion on mental health probably sufficiently covered that. Um, we believe testing will start again at CB Smith Park. Um, it is still, as I understand it, it's still by prescription only and by appointment only. So um, it's not a place that anybody can just go drive up to and, uh, and, and voluntarily they'll, they'll test you. Um, but we also understand from the state that some more, the, the more testing material and tests that can be read quicker are on their way into the market. And so, uh, you know, look for that in the coming days or week. Um, and once we start to get something that we can get a result uh, within minutes as opposed to within days, I mean, I, we had one case where we had an employee tested and the results were longer than the period of self-isolation recommendation. So we, we didn't have, we got results in exactly 14 days. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> you know, when it takes that long to get results, you just don't, uh, you know, you, you don't react as well as you probably could if you had better information. Um, telehealth, we've had a couple of great uh, hospitals reach out to us and want us to share their information. Um, one of them is uh, Care by Demand at Baptist Health South Florida. There's an app that's out there that I've downloaded, Baptist Health South Florida, um, and uh, you can register for it. They've waived all the co-pays at this point. You can put yourself in line for a visit with a physician on the phone. And uh, usually there's about eight or nine patients waiting per doctor that's on there, and you can pick who you want to talk to, and they will uh, talk to you over the phone. Um, the other one that we've been made aware of is Memorial. It's called Memorial Doc Now. It's another app. Um, that uh, has waived copays and all that you can register yourself for and get in line to uh, to meet with a doctor in a telehealth um, type environment. So I would suggest downloading both of those uh, those apps. We've talked about the cruise ships. Um, the recommendation for personal PPE, you know, that changes every day. Um, it's probably at this point still the CDC's guideline that healthy people. Um, in open air and practicing social distancing do not need um, a mask. And a lot of that I think is, is driven by supply and who needs them most. Um, you know, we need them in our healthcare system. We need them in our first responders. We uh, uh, had a, got to within about two days of really having some concern with our first responders just because there was no supply. The masks were kind of like the toilet paper in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, um, we're doing good now. Uh, we've got quite a creative uh, procurement um, division and uh, we were buying masks today at a, a fairly decent market rate, $3.50 to $4 per mask. Um, and I think we latched on to 18,000 of them today. So by next week, we should have a quarter million um, in our inventory. And I think that's where we need to just, uh, you can't have too many at this point. And so uh, uh, we're certainly uh, gonna have plenty for our first um, responders. Um, contact tracing, yes, us, the, you know, we, identif we identify cases to the Department of Health with rem remembering that this is really a health event more so than it is a response to a hurricane or some other type of um, disaster. So, um, you know, we, uh, we refer all those cases to DOH Broward um, and uh, that group would do the contact tracing. I think as we get more cases, that'll be easier to do too. So, um, we'll, uh, certainly support the Department of Health um, on that. Passengers on flights from these areas of the country that uh, have been identified as hotbeds, um, because FLL is a county run uh, airport and because it is actually physically in Broward County, it's the county along with the National Guard that's doing that uh, checking of passengers as they arrive um, into FLL. We have, uh, um, we've notified all of our fixed base, base operators um, in uh, FXE, which is our executive airport. Um, and so they have things to distribute to planes that arrive from those locations. We don't get a lot of planes from that, that distance at the executive airport. Um, but for those that might arrive from that area, they are given the information that says that the, the, there's a, the direction to uh, self-isolate for a period of two weeks upon arrival. I'm terribly concerned about the next topic, which is the protection of our first responders. They're on the front lines and we're continuing to deliver service. Um, we've changed a little bit up in the first response world where we've created squads in the police department and we're not doing shift swaps in the fire department and we're trying to keep even employees um, as separated as we possibly can uh, so that we don't have you know one of these viruses get into our public safety system and, and wipe out a whole shift or wipe out a whole, whole squad. 
Um, they're practicing as much distancing as they can. The, the fire, fighters don't even eat in the same place at this point uh, with each other in an attempt to, uh, you know, keep everybody as, as separate as, as possible. Um, again, it's important that we have the, the PPE, the personal protective equipment, uh, they're ready for them. Um, and uh, we have five confirmed cases in our police department um, at this point. So five confirmed, test confirmed cases. Um, no confirmed cases in the fire department yet, but at an assortment of different times, we've had anywhere between 15 and 27, 28 people in self-isolation because of contact risk. So, um, you know, we uh, say a prayer for them every day and, and uh, they keep rep uh, representing us very well. So general sanitation procedures within the city. Uh, you know, we, obviously we've had a little bit more time to do some more sanitation type work because our facilities aren't being used as often. Um, we've even taken it to the level of it sanitized on a more regular basis, the parking meter heads and other, you know, pay as you go uh, type machines so that uh, any place that somebody could come up, come into uh, touch is, uh, is a place that we look to, uh, to sanitize. Um, we've done a deep san uh, sanitizing uh, process at our DSD, which is a sustainable development uh, building because that was the facility that had the employee in it. Um, that had uh, flu-like symptoms uh, have since been confirmed to be negative. So that's a good uh, result there too. Um, our parks obviously are closed at this point and we have uh, um, you know, parks employees that, that we'd like to figure out how we can uh, keep, uh, <clears throat> keep on our staffing. And uh, you know, we're doing, we're playing some catch up in some places where folks can work alone and, and uh, you know, stay away from other people. There's a lot of stuff that we, put off when times are busy, busy. And now this is sort of a, a built-in pause break that we can uh, that we can get caught up on some of the maintenance things in the city that, uh, that otherwise get overlooked. So um, obviously we're pressure, continuing to pressure wash, um, continuing to uh, um, have a sanitation run, continuing to have bulk trash run. I think that's important. People rely upon bulk trash in our city. And uh, you know, the last thing we want to do is have big piles of debris sitting out in front of houses that don't get picked up. We, we know what that looks like um, after a hurricane and, and real quick, we could have you know, vermin and other insects and things with places to live that we just don't wanna, don't wanna go there until we have to. Um, finally for unemployment, you know, that's, uh, I went to that website today just to see how backed up it was. That's the Department of Economic Opportunity um, in Florida. Uh, they've made it fairly straightforward to apply. So. If, uh, anybody needs that, um, I just did a quick uh, search and it took me right to their webpage. It was fairly self-explanatory. Um, and uh, so that's easy. I say easy to do. I haven't done it yet. Commissioner Glassman hopefully won't cause me to uh, need to do that in the next couple months. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll certainly help as, as we can though. If we need to uh, um, point somebody to it, happy to help. Um, landlords demanding rent, that's going to be an interesting one. And I'm starting to do a lot of reading on, on places that are trying to deal with that um, from the government's perspective and how the, how, that, how the government inserts itself into that contractual relationship, because that's really what it is, is a contract relationship. Um, and uh, I think it's gonna take some declaration at a higher level to say, um, you know, you can't demand rent or you can demand half the rent or you can put it, uh, demand that it be pushed out three months or whatever whatever the right thing is. Um, that's gonna be a hard one though, because there's gonna be people that uh, just can't, um, can't continue to pay. Um, there are several different loan opportunities for small businesses. Um, that's one of the places that uh, um, is, there's really a lot of different options. Um, what I'd like to do there, because I gotta give kudos to our Chamber of Commerce, they put together a, a extremely comprehensive um, informational packet as to what the different options were if you were a small business and couldn't afford the salary or you couldn't afford to keep people on and who you would turn to for, for what. And um, I, I couldn't even do any justice of, uh, of trying to regurgitate what they did. So kudos to Dan Limblade and his group for uh, working on behalf of small business. And uh, uh, you know, we're trying to do creative things where we can. I, I'm certainly open to ideas. I mean, we came up with the idea and other folks are doing it too, where we created uh, in the afternoon during lunch and dinner, some 
free parking opportunities for takeout to food uh, on Los Olas Boulevard. You know, we trying our best to, to be a part of the solution. I can tell you, and I, I wanna end on this and then take questions that, uh, you know, we haven't changed any of the critical operations of the city. And, um, you know, we were, we were staffed in our police department, staffed in our fire department, um, continuing to deliver drinking water every day and treat wastewater. Uh, we'll continue to pick up the trash and, uh, and all of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Um, we are doing everything we can to keep folks healthy. And, uh, and if we can do that, then, then we'll, uh, we'll keep limping along until this thing decides to let go of us. Uh, we're gonna start meeting as a commission electronically. And uh, it, we did that yesterday, uh, it worked okay. Uh, I've got to hone it in a little bit, I think, for, uh, for next week when we'll have to interact with the public as well as um, produce the meeting. So, uh, you know, feel free to watch us next Tuesday. Um, and uh, if you watch us next Tuesday, it's not a very heavy, it's not gonna be a very heavy agenda, uh, partly because I wanna test and see how this works. Um, but we'll be back to where we're meeting. I do not know when we will be back to meeting with boards and committees. Um, I, if we can perfect a, a, a virtual solution, we'll try to do that sooner rather than later because there's things that just um, need to keep moving if they can. A lot of different projects when they come through the pipeline, they're all contingent or uh, dependent on some, some version of an approval. And uh, a lot of contingencies out there and, and a lot of folks that uh, wanna keep uh, moving forward and sometimes our processes, rightly so, get uh, get in the way. So um, I uh, would be happy to take any questions. I could, I, as you know, I could go on. I didn't think we'd be coming together on anything but water and sewer pipes here. You know what, I am so amazed that you don't have like 25 questions, but that's just a testament to how well you answered and responded to each of those categories. I know Christina uh, sent you privately a question or two, and Marilyn uh, also has a question about the safety of our water supply. Okay, so you're not, <laughs> you are gonna discuss this. Apparently there is stuff on yeah. the internet and people are pushing test kits. Right, so be, be skeptical of, of things that sound like that that don't make sense. So um, water supply is perfectly fine. Um, we're seeing a couple of scams uh, pop up and that's one of them. Uh, and the other is people walking around in suits offering to do um, COVID virus testing door to door. Nobody from the CDC is gonna show up at your house to do a test at your door. So uh, be skeptical of those kind of things, ask questions. Um, our drinking water is perfectly fine. Um, we do have, there is some literature out there, some literature out of Europe that would suggest that uh, COVID-19 could live in the wastewater system. And so uh, we're reading that out of, out of the Netherlands. Um, we're gonna start to do some additional tests of our wastewater system. And we're gonna try to do those by point at the, uh, at the pump station so that we can geographically get some idea. If we were to get a positive test, we could geographically get some idea as opposed to just testing at the plant. Um, the Netherland, Netherlands would suggest that uh, you can identify whether or not you've got uh, coronavirus in your community by testing the wastewater system. So uh, at this point, you know, we're, this is like a once in a lifetime response to something like this. So uh, we'll, we'll try everything and uh, can't, cer certainly can't hurt. So. Wonderful. So everyone that's on the call, there's a, uh, Chris is, you're wonderful. There's a virtual commission meeting next Tuesday. If there are any questions or issues that you would like Chris to take back to the commission, um, please start typing them in now so he has them. And while we're waiting for you to type your illustrious questions, Steve is going to try again to say hello. Um, and we might as well mention now, each district commissioner is doing virtual meetings and Dan Lindblade is actually, and Josh Rydell are on the uh, Commissioner Sorensen's 3 p.m. Zoom call tomorrow and Ben hosts daily 3 p.m. Zoom calls. Um, Commissioner Glassman and Commissioner Moretis are hosting pre-agenda virtual commission, pre-agenda virtual Zoom meetings on Monday. And I'm not sure about Commissioner McKenzie. Steve, I'm going to give you the opportunity to say hello while people type questions. Um, can you try to say hello again? 
And Keith, he's unmuted, right? Okay. Yeah, he is, sorry. Okay, so Commissioner Glassman, we cannot hear you. You're welcome to type as necessary, <laughs> uh, whatever you'd like to say. With that, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed that we don't have any questions. I do believe, Chris, it's due to the fact that you did such a stellar job. Do you wanna just take a, a, a minute or two just to talk about the regular operations of the city departments? You know, that it, everybody is still working, you know, building permits, code compliance and that kind of thing. Not, not you know, going on too long, but just to assure everyone uh, the city remains um, kind of in operation, if you will. Chris, that's a question for you. Sorry. I think he, I think he is. He's muted, and there are a couple of questions on the chat box. Too. There we go. I got, I got muted by the host, and I couldn't unmute myself. Um, all right, let's take a look here. How can the public give comments uh, during the virtual or the? Yeah. So, what we're where we're starting with that is today we put together um, a, a new page on our city's web page that people will go to ahead of a commission meeting if they wanna weigh in on a topic and indicate their intent and desire to weigh in on the topic. And then we will respond with a call in phone number that they can be provided um, individually and uniquely so that they can call in at the right time during the meeting to add to the, to the public record with those comments. We're not gonna be doing for right now anything quasi judicial just because it's difficult to swear people in with some level of certainty or take testimony, or cross examine in uh, a virtual environment that we figured out yet, but that's how we're gonna start. Um, there's some examples of governments that have done it that way and it seems to work well. So we're gonna try that at the first meeting and uh, if, if it goes well, great. If it doesn't, then we'll, uh, we'll regroup from there. But you should see next week's agenda published tonight and on the front page of the agenda will be a web address that says, go here to uh, register your intent to want to participate in the meeting um, and I am told tonight that like Commissioner Glassman's audio that that link is not working tonight, but it will be tomorrow. So we just wanted to get the agenda published for the commission to have it so that they have their full three or four days to, uh, to review it. All right, what, uh, Christina, you had two that you sent to me and can you remind me what, I can look real quick. The Fresno <laughs> Sheriff Office has implemented tracking for addresses where officers should take extra precautions due to COVID positive. I guess contract hmm. tracing stuff. If not, can you know, we? We're starting to do that locally rather than uh, on a countywide basis. Our fire depart department is, is tracking where they respond and transport people from. Um, we're doing about 18 to 20 transports a day. Um, and that, does that no longer includes Willowwood because they hired a private ambulance service to do the transports from the assisted living facility where the first cases were identified. So. Um, we will have it once it gets enough data on it that it has some value. We've got uh, uh, area, a map that we'll put out that shows where in the city we're, we're getting the transports from. Um, there's a new series of questions that the dispatchers are asking on every call that might have flu-like symptoms uh, involved in it. And then both police and fire responders are made known of the answers to those questions before they engage with somebody. So um, there's new protocols in the dispatch center. Uh, has there been alternative established to daily? Yes, we do not have daily in-person briefings anymore in the police department. They, uh, they do not do a together roll call. Um, they, if they do get together, they do some, do it in open air. Uh, we've moved our detectives uh, to a place where they uh, only come and engage in the police building uh, as often as they, very as infrequently as they need to. So if all of a sudden we have something that, that flows through our uniform uh, ranks that uh, we've got then, folks that are still police officers that just haven't been in uniform for a while ready to uh, ready to swap out with. So yes, the, no, uh, no in-person briefings. Training is very limited um, so that we don't have everybody in a classroom together. Um, and uh, so I think that we're, we're doing what we can there. Uh, talk about the courthouse. Be happy to. So um, the recent update I have, and it's as recent as today, um, is that uh, the GSA has indicated that they um, are not any longer considering the three sites that they uh, had originally went to the public with and, and wanted feedback. 
um, they identified four additional sites that they were now going to start exploring. Um, you know, the one that seems to be getting a little bit of traction, um, at least for, uh, as the discussion is, is forming, is a site that's right next to the courthouse in Broward County. Um, that might be a good site. You know, one of the other sites that they're looking at at this point is on Cypress Creek over by 95. I don't know that that makes a lot of sense to be all the way up there either. Uh, I think, you know, if there's a way that we can get them close to the Bright Line and close to the downtown, uh, it's good to keep that at those types of facilities at the core. Um, so that's the update I have on, on that. Um, Colleen, tell Steve he has to unmute himself. Uh, many of our central Fort Lauderdale neighborhoods are without Wi-Fi. Hmm. Okay, especially for neighborhoods identified by the... Interesting, okay, I, I, that, that's a great idea. Um, community Wi-Fi is, is fairly easy to get in if there's not Wi-Fi in an area. Um, so I'll take that as a takeaway and uh, explore that with our, with our team. You know what, Chris, that's an actually a, an extra relevant point these days. I'm getting kicked off conference calls, getting kicked off Zoom meetings when the host doesn't have strong Wi-Fi and the host can be a resident. And we're all kind of in this and systems are taxed and over capacity. So this is actually a really important point. If there is a way for Comcast or others to provide this um, bridge, this digital divide, that would be very helpful. Thank you, Tara, for that question. Yeah. And, you know, they maybe can even do it uh, quickly. So, you know, every time there's a special event, for example, you know, you've got a golf tournament or you've got a, a base, major league baseball game, all these wireless companies bring in, they call it a cow, a cellular on wheels. And so that amps up their, uh, their coverage in the area where there's a high density of people. And so maybe I can even uh, explore whether or not we can do that quickly in the form of temporary service. So that's a, that's a great takeaway. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll work on that. Um, anybody else? Um, I, I, think, I think I'd like to just ask a question of everyone on the call. Was this a productive and useful conversation for everybody? And maybe, you know, raise your hand or mute, you know, chat or otherwise indicate your uh, willingness and interest. I, I see Stephanie waving. Um, well, so, I can mute everyone too, if you'd like. Yeah, so anybody no. that wants to add anything, and I think the other thing I'd like to ask is, we talked about social services tonight. We don't know what we're gonna be doing a month from now. But you know, we have options for healthcare providers and for folks who specialize in financial aid and assistance and businesses. You know, what do we as the council, what can we do to provide support and information? As long as Chris is a regularly featured guest on a monthly basis. Um, if you would like anything specifically highlighted in terms of topics, we'll follow up by email. Um, and I'm gonna uh, allow all of you to say whatever you'd like to say. So thank so you, thank Chris. You. Thank you, thank you. Great, great job, Chris. You're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Well, there's a lot of people out there doing a great job, but I just get to talk about it, so. So it's good. Thank you. Online meetings, very informative. 10 out of 10, that's William Brown, you're the best. Steven, thank you for all you do. This is a great city with great citizen volunteers. We will get through this together. Absolutely awesome. Abby, this is excellent. Barbara simply says yes. <laughs> okay, everybody. Um, I think we have one agenda item to vote on. And it's, we do have a quorum. I'm almost positive about that, Mary. Um, this was an approval for the meeting minutes from the general meeting last month. Do you, and it, do you believe that we had a general meeting on March 10th? I mean, it's unbelievable that we had that in person now. Incredible. So um, can I have a motion for approval? Uh, of I move to approve. Okay. I second. All right, so Luis, uh, motion, Kelly, second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 I love this. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, is, any, is there anything else that anybody wants to talk about tonight before we close the call? 
All right, good enough. You guys be safe, stay well, have a great evening. We'll be back. Thank in touch you, everybody. Oh, okay. Bye. Bye. All right, Thanks. good night. Keith, oh my gosh, we forgot to thank Keith. Okay. Keith was thank a Oh, yeah. Night. Poor Keith. Thank no, you, Keith. Keith. A lot of words. He facilitated all of this. You were amazing, Keith. Thank Marilyn, you. Marilyn, so cheers, but I finished mine. Okay. All right. All right. Bye, guys. All right. Take care. <laughs>